right? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I'm especially for the the kids who who are the stalwarts for showing up to this thing. You, you don't have to wait for a music entrepreneurship class to talk about being resilient mm -hmm. and being patient enough with yourself to to give yourself options across a pretty broad spectrum of stuff. Mm -hmm. I just did a talk with um, University of Oregon on what musicians do well inherently. Um, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. And they, they stayed and asked questions for 40 minutes after That's the thing phenomenal. was over with. It was yeah, great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we're going to get into that today. Well, let's see how we go. If there's, yeah, yeah. Play, if there's playing to be done, I'm happy. I'm not saying the sour grapes. It's more like... To be productive journey. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And there's plenty yeah. of there's plenty of stuff to talk about in the world of auditions and and being on for when you have to be on. Totally. Okay. Good. Right. So we have a plan. Yeah. We'll do it. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Here they come. Here we go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Glad to have you here. Hello, Haley and Alex. Anna, greetings. Christian, good to see you. Reina, welcome back. Carly, Emilio, Paul, Carrie, Peter, and Devin. And we will continue to let folks in. I know that the, um, I know John Weber's class sometimes uh, bumps over, so we'll, we'll get some folks in as well. But I am delighted to welcome you back at three minutes to the top of the hour for the second installment in this pair of a continuing series of master classes here at the Aaron Copeland School of Music. Welcome to the Zoom audience. Welcome to the YouTube audience. Frank Morelli is a bassoonist, a teacher, an advocate, a cheerleader. Um, he is, we, we've been bouncing around the word resilient for the last five minutes or so. And all of those things sort of meet in an audition. All of the things that you are as a musician, all of the things that you plan for, and the things that you want to give over in those few moments about the very best thing that you can do culminates in an audition. And that audition isn't always uh, behind a screen or in front of a jury. Sometimes it's talking to somebody who's interviewing you for a scholarship. Uh, sometimes it's a job interview. But the idea that you concentrate performance to a specific goal is what we're talking about today. And so I am delighted to welcome back Professor Frank Morelli. Fire away, Gridley. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Once again, the maestro did an excellent job of framing what we've been talking about, what we are going to talk about. Today, is, this is the last of this series of, of uh, presentations that we planned for this semester, of mine. And it's been a real pleasure to share this stuff with you. You know, I'm new at the Aaron Copeland School of Music uh, this semester. Uh, the second, well, the uh, first, well, where are we? I'm getting confused. The, the, this is my second semester. It's You've like, been here for 32 years. 32 years. <laughs> no, this is the second semester. I had started in this at the beginning of the second semester of the previous school year. Right. And yep. Top there. of the year. You got a top of the year to you. And um, one of the things that, one of the main things that attracted me to take on at my advanced age a new position was the job description, which was not just bassoon teacher, which is something I love to do, but uh, a lecturer in winds, in woodwinds. And while I've been teaching at other institutions and uh, working with wonderful family of bassoon students over decades, I have, just by the nature of my life and the nature of my relationships with other schools, uh, not had the opportunity to have a regular interaction on a regular basis, let's say, with a larger student body. And so that is really what excited me and attracted me 
about the opportunity at Queens College. And uh, of course, since I was a student, I was aware of Queens College. And at that time, when I was younger, I, many of the teachers were people I knew of or knew somewhat personally as a new guy on the scene and always admired and had quite a lot of affection, for instance, with, for Ronald Roseman, Ronnie Roseman, who taught oboe at the school and others, not to start naming some people and forgetting others, but we'll just start with St. Ronnie, who's unfortunately no longer with us and was an incredible person and an incredible musician. And so, you know, in my mind, the concept of Queens College was always a place of excellence and where people I admired worked. <laughs> so the opportunity to join, the, the thought that I could join that faculty to be at that inst this institution was, uh, was a wonderful opportunity for me. And I'm really grateful to, to be part of it. And as I already said, grateful to be able to have a dialogue with students beyond the bassoons, although I love doing that and, and it's not a question of quality, I guess, a question of quantity, the opportunity to reach out to more people. Um, and so here we found ourselves, we're, we're going to get into the, the topic of today's lecture in a minute, I assure you, about auditions or playing repertoire and all that and the things to be looking for in preparation and in performance. But as, uh, as uh, Professor Powell mentioned about resilience, we found ourselves in this COVID situation. And I proposed, I wasn't asked, uh, you know, we were all discussing how could we be involved? How can we help? How can we create a new curriculum in many ways? Uh, just very quickly, that would really be our goal to be of benefit to you. And I believe it is I'm not trying to be self serving, but I wouldn't do this if I didn't think it was useful to you. And I, th I thought, wow, well, here's a chance for me to do exactly what I was hoping to do at Queens College. And that is to reach a considerable number of our wonderful wind, all students, but obviously winds and brass tend to show up to this. Although many of the topics were designed really to cross party lines, so to speak, both in terms of instrument family and degree, such as music education, which I'm a product of the music ed system in Massapequa, Long Island, and without it, I wouldn't be here today, and therefore I have a great deal of, of appreciation and regard for music educators and the, the, qual the value in my own life of music education. So, so about resilience, it's like, okay, well, all right, we have this situation, the COVID and we're home and we're locked down and all whatever terminology you want to give to it. And so that's why this set of classes came to happen, came to be. So I'd like to think, hopefully it's been useful to you and therefore it is a silver lining in the clouds, you know, that every cloud has a silver lining. I hope this has been one of them. And uh, I look forward to other opportunities to do this, whether it remains online for a while or not. And then uh, back when we have the real pleasure of being in each other's company. So uh, what the final phase of these lectures was gearing towards, you might say in a way, was at practical application. Uh, all the things we talked about and aspects of making a sound and in the case, of course, a lot of stuff at the beginning is in the first classes to do with the winds in particular, about support and breathing and all the things that go into it. But remembering that all of this technical talk, all of this thinking about form and mechanics and, and uh, you know, physical disciplines and all that is only useful in that it serves the music. And so, sure, we're how to tongue better, how to make a better vibrato, how to play soft, which is something we all could learn better, usually, most of us, including yours truly. And, uh, but really with the idea of applying that to performance. In this particular case, the main focus of these last couple of classes is on 
playing behind the screen or playing a, a live audition, playing a recorded, um, a recorded um, uh, anonymous audition, you know, like an audio but not video audition. And so, uh, and the argument that I've made, and I think it's absolutely true, not because I know it, but it's been said by people smarter than I, that, that our brains function differently if we're watching someone perform versus just listening to a disembodied sound. And so, and to make the long and short of it, because we've discussed this before, when you're listening to the disembodied sound, virtually everything about that performance is magnified. Uh, every little articulation, every little turn of phrase, use of vibrato, intonation, becomes even more obvious to the listener than if they were watching you perform. And phrasing, for instance. So, uh, that was the focus of this. So, um, I know, not, again, we don't have many um, people have contributed to be part of the class today, but fortunately, my stalwart Sequoia is here with the Tchaikovsky, uh, and I think Anna, are you interested in working on some of that, uh, some of the things we even discussed further last week? Yeah, I also uploaded the third one. There were three excerpts, so we didn't touch the third one. So. Great, great. Uh, I, I, well, we'll get, all right. Well, actually, I tell you what, why don't we start with Anna, just so I don't show my, ob I'm trying to hide my obvious preference for the bassoon, Sequoia, but we have to, like, make believe we think other instruments are okay. So you you can wait a couple of minutes. Okay, you understand. You know, we have to. And we like Anna anyway, right? In the rep class, she's a very nice woman and beautiful player. So I guess we'll let, all right, Sequoia agrees we could have a flute player start off today. So um, last week, and I'll, we've, the last time we saw the Mass Crusaders, we were, uh, uh, you had played, we were working, and then we did later in rep class on articulation on, uh, well, we did the Mendelssohn, right? Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And we talked about how to work. Uh, did you have an opportunity? I know the weeks fly by and you have many things going on in your life. But did you have any opportunity to work on those techniques that we discussed last week? Yes, I did. But I still didn't get a chance to record. Oh, that's okay. What did, first of all, let's, uh, actually, Joseph, could we hear the Mendelssohn? Sure, which, I'll do that. That was the first one. Well, anyway, you know which one it is. He knows. Uh, with video or without? Uh, actually, with what? Sorry, going the mail, I uh, highlighted it Masterclass November 9th. So it's I sent it on Sunday, November 8th. So there is a folder, Google Drive. He has it. He has it. I think what he's saying is with or without video. I'm saying for now, like we were doing last week, let's hear it without video. Thank you. That's what he was asking, I think. Right, Joseph? Professor. Correct. All right. See, I got it right for once. It happens now and then. I Things, clarity. Moment of clarity. Good. Here it comes. <laughs> So then we talked because the um, as we talked about this last week, <clears throat> incorporating actually what had been the classes prior to these last classes. One of the things, well, the main goal of the previous two classes was the deconstruction of excerpts: how to improve a piece of music you've practiced over and over again. 
And so it creates, you might say, two major problems. One is uh, you've practiced it over and over again. So how are you going to make it better? Like how many more times going through the same thing is going to make it better? And secondly, we actually become, a, and I mean, they go together. They, they you know, can say maybe it's all the same thing. They kind of, uh, it's obviously, obviously all interrelated. However, how do you keep working on something that because you've played it so many times, it's so ingrained in you and we become sort of numb to it in a way. It's like you're doing it, but are you really hearing it? You know, I mean, I'm talking for myself now and for ex the experience I've had in working with professional, young professional artists like Anna or and Sequoia, who is a budding young professional already at, in her own right. Yeah, she gives the look, but she is. And uh, so this idea. So in that regard, instead of me telling the audience, what did, what did you work on this week on that particular excerpt? Yeah, so I really broke it down and I practiced everything slower in a slower, much slower tempo. So just to make sure you know everything, coordination of the fingers and my hanging. So then I, I practice like 50% of the measure and then another 50%. And then I would try uh, mm -hmm. or, and just play like on play important notes, <laughs> notes that have to be accented and still like try to be every everything even, to play everything as even as possible. You know? Okay. So and, and the then, reasons, like, great. Uh, I'm sorry. Taka, instead of saying taka 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 the master class uh, one time ago so uh adding repeating the same pattern so adding the uh, measures that don't exist in order to maintain this is like to me it's been really challenging to do only two breaths as it's written in the, in the part and being box stressors suggesting so so yeah just keep the tempo and still keep this you know <laughs> no tempo that's supposed to be allegro vivace and then uh breathe only at two spots so that's that's really like <laughs> the most challenging thing so by adding extra notes and playing slower and still being able to breathe that helped me a lot and then it felt so easy to play it faster in the real tempo and great so you by adding a challenge then you kind of condition yourself to a greater challenge than you actually have to do in that regard and uh, it lightens it up when you go back and say oh this isn't so bad like you have, you know, doing some sort of workout or running with, uh, say, those people would sometimes use those like ankle weights and then you run and you take them off and you feel uh, a little more light footed. I will never achieve being light footed, but that the the effect, the, 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 the opportunity for that to have a good effect is, is there. Um, definitely feels like a flute gym <laughs> <laughs> yeah flute gym well it is a sort of we go back to the gym we go to the gym and we work on the composite parts of our performance of our need you know our, our uh, it's physical those are physical aspects and of course there's also the you know the intellectual the mental parts of it now the reason the other thing to remember and i want the audience i want to underscore because everything you said was right and it sounds like you did all the right stuff. The reason to go slowly is definitely to be aware of your fingers. But another reason for me to go slowly, and I'm not saying you weren't doing this, but just to point out to the listeners, is that, and to quote my teacher again, 95% of articulation is tone production. So the way in which you're going to get a clear articulation and even to facilitate going faster because you'll be meeting resistance, as we talked about in the first episodes of this, this uh, our ongoing, hopefully it's not a sitcom, maybe, I don't think it's a drama, but hope, maybe an adventure series, is um, 
that because you're meeting up with the resistance, your tongue will feel less need to work hard. And anytime you're working hard in a physical activity, you will most likely go slower and you will, your endurance will be less. You will have less endurance, whatever that is. So tonguing is that way too. What do you think about the idea, like when you play fast, think slow? Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. You want to see if you can expand that in your mind that even though you're going at this tempo, you, you can feel the kind of a slow motion feeling. And, and in fact, when you, you know, in sports psychology, when uh, and, uh, great art athletes are interviewed, they often say in the old days, even like Bill Russell, who was a basketball player that I admired, he's, you know, it's from another generation. He's been on TV and stuff as a commentator in the past and all. But he would say he felt like the game, he knew where the ball was going. <laughs> the game was like a video, like a, meaning a tape, that time video tape. We used to use tape. Anyway, uh, that he, in almost slow-mo, can see what was going on. That's the sort of being in the zone, you know, different ways that people describe that presence, having presence. Um, so the more you can do that, the better. So obviously doing out at the slow speed, you could become so aware of it in that more inside, you know, at the slower tempo, then you could kind of be aware of that at a faster tempo. It helps you. Now, the other thing I was getting down to is in going slowly, the idea is not just to make sure your fingers line up if you're doing it in legato. And why do it in legato? Just to get the tongue out of the way and get first the sound right. So you're doing it in legato to get the sound right and to find the resonance on every single note. Because as I've joked before in this class and elsewhere, my brilliant Einstein level analysis of sound is each note has three parts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's why they call me the professor. And the fact is the quality of the sound, the quality of an articulation comes from the middle, the sound not from the tongue at the beginning or a tongue at the end. So when you're practicing it slowly, the idea is to find that res first legato, finding that resonance in the sound, and then figuring out, figuring out how to tongue without messing that up. How to, how to create a light articulation, single or double, depending on the excerpt, slow or fast, depending on the excerpt, and still be in your truest sound. And the thing is, if you're more in your sound, your technique sounds better. Your fingers may be going, we may be able to measure with some sort of measurement that your fingers and tongue had moved exactly the same as they had the previous time. But this time you were more into the sound and it will all sound better. I there it is. I mean, Dad, I came to that conclusion on my own and I was like, thank you for just pointing that out. Good. So, uh, so you feel like it's, you didn't get a chance to record it, but you feel like it helped. Definitely, definitely. Especially this is one of like must and, every audition. Like. And what you have to do is this. Let's say, I'm just going to use the tempo, you know, any tempo, you know, like a fast tempo in, you know, in Beethoven 4, or maybe you have a tempo there, a genie has a tempo there, Professor Backstresser, I mean, has it, a tempo. Quarter note, uh, dotted quarter note 80 to 88. All right, eight, let's say 88. So let's say right now you're at 44, half tempo. There's only 44 clicks between 44 and 88. You have to set a goal that over two months, I am going to go from 44 to 88 or in 44 days, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, I, I think earlier on, I don't know if I did it in this, but one of the goals I set for my, I talked about this in these classes, but one of my goals for last summer, uh, when the COVID hit, it was actually my son. I think I told you the story. My son said to our son said, dad, you should record your Paganini Caprice and put it on Facebook. That'll make your students practice. So I'm thinking, I'm 69 years old, or maybe then I was only 68. I was a kid. 
but it was around the, my birthday time probably. And I'm thinking, oh, I thought maybe I had left that piece in the past. But then I set a goal for myself. I'm going to get this back up in six weeks and record it for, for Facebook. And I literally had a piece of paper with numbers for the different variations, what, where I wanted to get to and where I was. And I marched down the field one yard at a time. And I eventually got to the goal. So the thing is, whether it's Marriage of Figaro for bassoon players, for which I have different, I think I might have showed some of, some of the kinds of ideas or shared with you about how to break that down, you know, which you can use for any other piece of music. If you set that goal, and, and here's the key though, like in the case of the Mendelssohn, and I need this because I am impatient and undisciplined by nature. So I must tie myself to the mast. So not to be not to be waylaid by the siren song of go faster, go faster, you know, see if you could do it. I'm used to that because I, I, I've been a practitioner of that, that weakness for decades and uh, many decades. I am a professional after all. So, but what you have to say is as you move up the line, like in this one, this is when you know you, you can't get a job without doing it, without being able to play the Mendelssohn. You cannot get a bassoon job without the figure out. So you must conquer it. You must. Not a question. It's a fact. It's a fact for me. It's not a fact for you, young person. Well, for me, old man, I'm not taking auditions. So I guess I don't have to. But if I took an audition, I'd have to be able to nail Figaro. There's no getting around it. So you must conquer it. You must. And the fact is, now I'll give you the, that's a reality, which is not bad news. It's not bad news. It's reality. I'll tell you the good news. I know you're playing, Anna. I know you. You absolutely can do this. I haven't even one molecule of doubt about it. I mean, I don't. You absolutely can do it. But it will take this disciplined approach. And as you march up the field one click at a time or however you do it, you must consistently ask yourself, am I still doing this as well as I did now that I'm at 50 when I was at 44? I'm not talking about my age now, but about the metronome speed. As Julie Baker, being a Euroflutist, used to say, I played with him after he retired from the Philharmonic and we'd be doing chamber music concerts and he'd say, oh, you should have heard me when I was 74. <laughs> and the thing is, he played great into his 80s, but that was his... Weisenheimer remark. He'd say, oh, you should have heard me when I was 74. I use it now. I say, oh, you should have heard me when I was 68. So, uh, so um, because as soon as you move that metronome up and give up on that level of value, you start to lose the, the battle. And the thing is, you can do it. And it will, you could try to set a goal of six weeks like I did, and I could have played it better, but I thought I could put up with this for six weeks and I'm out of here. And I wasn't trying to get a job. I was just trying to show off on the internet for my son, you know, to make, to, because he set the challenge for me. But um, if, if it turns out 44 days becomes 60 days, it becomes 60 days. But that's what? That's two months. In two months, you could say, I could nail, if you called me in the middle of the night, I can nail the Mendelssohn. And not out of bravado, out of the fact that you put in the work. And that is the best form of self-confidence there is. I can do this because, not because I'm a good person, which you are, you know, and your parents love you, which they do. And everyone else loves you who, who couldn't. Because you put in the work, not because we wish it for you, which we do, because you put in the work and you have the talent. I know you have the talent, like I said, that I know. Don't worry about it. That, and I'm, you know, I'm saying this to Anna right now, it's a fact for every one of us. 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. There's no way around that. Believe me, I spent a lifetime trying to figure out how I could get away with not practicing. <laughs> I never came up with a very good solution. So I've fallen back on the, the old, you know, 
Let's practice. All right. So now the question is, do you want to try playing this live or we'll work on it in another uh, rep class, you and I, at another another time? <laughs> yeah. No, and not because I don't want to hear. I'm just saying because of the, the sound and all, you know, it's harder to appreciate it with the Zoom and everything like that. But those method, the methodology by which you are practicing it and what I'm espousing as well, which we're agreeing anyway, it's not like we're arguing anything, just backing you up, is just listen to me, dear, beautiful audience, beautiful students of Queens College. We were talking about, before you all came on, actually how much we appreciate you all. Professor Powell and I were about how, what great students there are at Queens College. And so uh, uh, you can all do this, but this is the work it takes. And I would be not doing my duty by you to say otherwise. But it's not bad news. Work is noble. We're put on this earth to do something. <laughs> you know, my stock is peasant stock, so I am very well genetically encoded for more to like move rocks and dig holes for trees. But I've tried to apply that work ethic to play in the bassoon, a little bit fancier art form than uh, than farming. And but it so, still looks like a tree, so you're still good. Looks like, you got it. That's right. <laughs> wow, now I you're understand. So on. You just answered the meaning of life. <laughs> wow, right here in living color. Wow. There it is. All right, I'm going to go plant a tree or practice a bassoon. I'm not sure which. See ya. All right, you had one other excerpt that we didn't listen to, right? Obviously, the St. Matthew's Passion from. Ah. Okay, how did you work on this? Definitely uh, singers. I, I, uh, I got a chance to play this with the singers. Oh, it's great, right? Imitating the voice. I got to record the Scherza in Fida from Handel's operas. Uh, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, I forget which opera it's from. It'll come to me. But the aria, I got to record that with Tatjana Trianos on a record with um, Julie Riddell and, and, um, and then I got to do it uh, with uh, Lorraine Hunt Lieberson, who unfortunately passed away, who was, a, she was a wizard when she sang. And we did it in, actually in Carnegie Hall with Orpheus. And she, we, I sat right next to her as she sang and she had her hand on my shoulder. And uh, I'll never forget it. It was like, to play, we don't have a lot of those obligato arias that you have a million of them. Uh, that is heaven on earth playing that stuff, right? It is heaven on earth to play. I mean, I love playing the continuo parts too, so I'm not complaining. Playing continuo and Bach and, and Handel is like, you can't do better than that. For a bassoon player, for anybody, but certainly for a bassoon player, heaven on earth, in my opinion. But it is great what you said about listening to singers. Play along with the singer. Don't listen to the flute player. Listen to the singer. In my day, it was like Ellie Ameling. I don't know who the, the hip singers are now, but we used to listen to a lot of Ellie Ameling singing, that kind of stuff. Also, her, her recording with Heitink of the Mahler Four, I think. I think it was with Heitink. It was really something. The, the voice part in the Mahler Four is like heavenly. Okay, so let's listen to this Bach. I'll stop uh, rhapsodizing about uh, playing with singers and, uh, and my, actually, my jealousy of all that great music you have. Okay, go ahead, Joseph. I'll shut up.
nice way to start the week. Thank you. And uh, just, just beautiful. So there isn't much to say except, wow, that was beautiful. The things you can work on are make, even when you're running out of air, making sure you finish the end of each phrase. <clears throat> and you did it pretty much. These are more things to continue doing them as if it's not as if you didn't do these things most of the time. So it's not like, why don't you try phrasing? <laughs> it's not like that. This is little, little things. When you play at your level, here's the other problem. And I think we've talked about this. Like I talk about the sort of triangle of or a pyramid of excellence. The higher up that pyramid you get, there are fewer people around you. From a, so in terms of an opportunity point of view, <clears throat> competitive point of view, um, that's a fact. But most often the improvements you can make, and that's also what we've been talking about here, become more and more in small tolerances. And therefore they take a great deal of analysis and introspection and taking of responsibility to finish the job. Yeah. I need to interrupt you, but I just I just realized actually just putting all that work, everything you're saying, you know, like Judy that is telling me too, and I, it's just like I feel so exhausted after practice session. Like I just like as you're saying the amount <laughs> that you really put all yourself into it and really like have a great two even two hours, three hours, like you spend with your instrument and you're really like hundred percent into it. It's just like I, I feel so exhausted. <laughs> But that's a wonderful feeling of exhaustion. You know, you know, uh, you want to, you know, I say, don't burn the candle at both ends, burn the candle at both ends. Give yourself totally to it. We're so lucky. I know you know this. I'm preaching to the choir here is how fortunate we are that this is how you get. This is how you use your time in pursuit of the truth and the beauty of this music and in yourself of trying to improve yourself. My own teacher, he knew he was dying and I called him the week before he died and he was still teaching till, well, two weeks before. I went to see him a week before he passed away and he had just finished teaching for the last time, his students. And he said, well, I had to say goodbye. You know, I, I had to have one more lesson with them. And when I'd call him on the phone, even though he was sick, he'd say, Franco, how you doing? Yeah, I was just working. And he'd say, you know what's so great about teaching? You get together with the student and you're always in search of the truth in all different ways. <laughs> From scraping the reed, you know, our picadillo, our problem of, you know, our cross, as he would say it, our cross the bear, of trying to find, just get, coax a sound out of that piece of grass to... Bach and trying to find it, right? You're, try, you're finding the truth in yourself, the truth in the music. And, and what could be more valuable on which to expend your energies, right? And so we are, it's a difficult profession and these days a difficult world, but like hearing you play that, I mean, the place you took all of us and, and you know, with our jangled nerves and crazy life at the moment. And even if life was had no problems in it, it would still affect us. But maybe right now the medicine's even a little more appreciated, right, than usual. So I'm glad you say you're exhausted when you're done. It's a that's a good thing, you know, and you apply yourself, you go into it. I know myself, I, you know, my life, you know, music, you know, the old joke, music is my life. Well, music is my life. It's my avocation, my vocation. It's both. It's my hobby. It's my, it's the thing I love to do other than my family. You know, the thing I love to do more than anything in this world is to be involved in music. Right? And so, all right, now, end of the sermon. You got your Sunday sermon on a Monday in that pretty church where you work. And uh, so I finished my sermon. And the ends of cer certain phrases, remember like that going back now to technical stuff, sorry to come off the waxing poetic and back to nuts and bolts. But remember what my picture of the idea of the, the, just the picture of a diminuendo as thinking of it as two lines on a graph. As either you're coming off the last note because you're running out of air 
or you're making or you're just ending the last note or you're uh, making a diminuendo. They're kind of all the same. Remember, the support must intensify to meet the airstream. As soon as you start not keeping up with support, and I hate to even say keeping up because I don't mean necessarily up, but keep committed and engaged. Use a better word so it's, that's less subliminal, negative, potentially subliminally bad message. As the more engaged you remain, the more you can control that to the very end. So there are a few phrases where you could have finished a note with just a little more resonance or beauty than you did. Because why it's always something, but that's what to work on now. And to remember when you are running out of the air, as I notice myself, and like I say, I'm a big guy and I'm blown into this little tube, I seldom run out of air. Plus the way I talk, you can tell I seldom run out of air. But the thing is that as I notice that happening, not so much when I'm speaking, but when I'm playing the bassoon, I immediately think shoulders down, get my back into it, get my support so that I know, sort of like wringing out the sponge or the, the, the rag, this rag, that, that I'm going to be as tightly engaged, as strongly engaged as possible to control, to wring the very last drop out, right? So that's what you could do a little more than you did. In many other ways, it just sounded beautiful. That's simple as that. And so if I were listening to you critically on an audition, that's what I would notice. A few phrases didn't quite finish as beautifully as some others. And the other thing along these lines, which you were basically doing is, so many of them are exactly the same phrase. But none of them are the same, right? And uh, they just look the same, just like all the running eighth notes in a Bach piece, or it's say, uh, one of the preludes to the, like, especially like D minor prelude to the and the second cello suite, because we like to play that. And the D minor one is particularly approachable for a bassoon player, like idiomatic for a bassoon player. Notes are just running by, they all look exactly the same. <clears throat> Each one of them is a little different than the other, has a different basis in the harmony and the direction and the mode. I mean, it all goes together. And the more you look at Bach, as I know you know, the more you realize, oh my God, this is, how did he put this all together? Like it becomes every time I discover even something new about the relationships of notes and passages in the music, right? So what a gift he left us, right? I just wish he would have left the bassoon players a few more gifts under the tree, but I'll try not to be too angry about it. So finish the phrases, react to the harmony. So one phrase in the next, that ending is just a little different than the previous or the next. And you know this. I'm just saying even work to bring that out more. I'm not saying this like that doesn't occur to you because you know it. I know you know it. That's my advice. Exactly how I felt when I listened to myself to this recording. Well, there you go. Well, I'm glad to have my opinion backed up by an authority. So I know that I'm in good shape. <laughs> so I'll look forward to, uh, I guess you played last week, so... Well, I'll see you this evening, but we'll we'll work on I'll look forward to our next adventure. Beautiful, thank you. All right. And now now, Sequoia, let's hear some some uh Chike four. And actually for this, where is it? Yes. Uh Joseph, is it possible for you to run it but for me to sh to share the screen with you? Or does that screw things up? Um, we could try it. Are you are you just trying to show the video or? Oh, I know. Yeah, no, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, well, I guess I can. No, I what I. I have the video queued up already. Yeah, cool. Uh, what I was gonna do is, I could maybe I could put it up in if I knew how to put it up in the chat, we'd be dangerous. It was that we did it before, we used it before. It was. The roadmap for the Tchaikovsky Four solo. Um, well, I tell you what, let's just listen to it first. Let's see. We may or may not need it uh, so much. So let's hear. This is the slow movement solo to the Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony. So let's hear it once through, and then we'll talk a little bit with Sequoia about it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, make sure you count out that last note. Dee dee da 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 one two 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 three off. Okay, that's a small point. Beautiful. The main point is beautiful job, beautiful job, Sequoia, and every week you sound more and more comfortable with the reed change and the embouchure. You know, it just you keep getting more and more into the sound. So, a few things to watch out for. One thing is the use of vibrato, for those of us that are vibrato users. You tended in this version of it, and I didn't notice this when we worked on it, but it's good, we work on it today, is sometimes you vibrate one note and not the next. Now, that doesn't mean we have to vibrate each note equally throughout every passage. But remember that when you vibrate a note that calls attention to it, and if you vibrate a note but not the next note or the previous, then you're creating a hierarchy between those nerds, notes, nerds, and your nerds, but your notes in terms of the phrasing. Right? Can we hear it again and listen? Let's all listen carefully to where it's, it's very beautifully done, but this is how you could improve it. So uh, let's listen, uh, if you don't mind, Joseph, again. And people, keep an eye, uh, keep an ear out, I guess, for the use of vibrato. Okay, you could stop with that. Oh, wow, that was good. On a dime. He stopped that on a dime. Uh, you hear... You, sometimes we go like dee -da, dee -da, like that. So um, that's something to be careful for. As I and and you know in this excerpt, dee -dee -da, da -da, dee -da, you know going into the downbeat leading tone, that's a good spot for the vibrato. And you did that early in the phrase. It was as the phrase went on, it got a little more of that. And that's a very common thing that people do. So you're not the first, nor will you be the last. But that's something you can improve. The other thing is, and you and I have discussed this even more, and it's hard on a recording to try to set up to, to, to uh, show the phrasing through dynamics, right? Uh, but it's not just dynamics. It has a lot to do with the intensity of the sound. And the vibrato helps with that or hinders it if it's not quite balanced properly, right? And if you remember from last time, actually, Joseph, oh, I guess I'm allowed to share the screen, right? I'm probably already allowed to share the screen. So you should be able to. Yeah, right. Uh, so uh, if I could just figure out what the heck I'm doing, which, of course, is asking a lot. But here, let me share the screen just for a moment. Share the screen. Well, I'll put computer sound on, but we're not really going to play anything. Here is uh, uh, an open slideshow from current slide. So this was the, um, I'm just sorry, I just want to get this out of the way a little bit. Sorry to obscure everybody for the moment. The idea of how this particular solo is constructed. So the idea is, as I pointed out to you previously, so I won't belabor the point too much because we did do this at another time. The general message is create roadmaps for your solos, right? That, that would be the general lesson to everyone. But in this particular case, in the first phrase, he goes to the downbeats. And as I pointed out before, if you think of it like at a very slow tempo and put two bars together, two bars here together, the first bar would be the downbeat. The downbeat of the first bar would be beat one. The downbeat of the second bar would be beat two, which by definition would be weaker than the downbeat of the bar. So this would be weaker as I've shown here with my scrawl. And that continues. The third phrase does not do the same thing. So you do not go to the downbeat. You continue. And, it's so, and as I said about the rule of threes, you have two shorter phrases that are basically similar, if not exactly the same, followed by an answer which is generally twice as long. 
Now, in the second phrase, he puts an accent in these bars, the second bar. The one I said is weak. So Tchaikovsky, and this is what led me to think this way, Tchaikovsky is saying, I want you to accent the weak bar. Therefore, you cannot accentuate the downbeat. You have to play it backwards, you might say. So that's why I suggest even a little diminuendo to help avoid leaning on that note. But the last phrase, very much like the previous one, even though it has a jump in it, and goes for a longer time and is twice as long. Also, the harmony, the A flat and G flat, it's a little bit more somber than, than uh, harmonically, which goes right along with the way it's planned out. So that's, if you have those, that playbook in mind, and Sequoia does, but you could bring it out a little more, I know, because we've talked about it and she's showing it, so, but the way to make it even better is with that, those recommendations, right? You, you've, got, you've got the idea already, you're getting it, and I'm really happy with where your sound is going in, in this. Uh, and uh, let's, we're in the midst of putting together the bassoon class right now, we're putting together the March of the Marionettes for the four of us. And Sequoia sent me her, once we figured out the gain, got the sound right, she sent me her recording, her line, which is the third line, I'm playing the fourth line. And uh, Sequoia, your, once I cut, you know, we had it in sections, but your, um, your part and mine lined right up your, your ear, you were really listening, and I felt like you were playing with me you know, because uh, I had already put mine down, so I didn't have the pleasure of doing it the other way around and playing with you. But I really noticed that you stuck with me. We were, were using a click, but still, I didn't sound to me, it didn't sound to me like you were playing with a click. I felt like you were playing with me. And it was very easy to plant your line into the, I use GarageBand because, uh, like I said, if I wrote the manual on GarageBand, it wouldn't, wouldn't even be GarageBand for dummies. It would be GarageBand with rock and stick. That would be, you know, for GarageBand for cavemen, which is me. So, uh, but I have mastered. Oh, look at that. It's got an espresso. Is that an espresso you have there? Yeah, Mr. In honor of you for this, absolutely that's an espresso. Whoa, you're making my <laughs> mouth water. So, um, so... Sequoia, your musicianship is strong, is what I'm saying, you know, that, that it really, I felt like you were a real partner in and doing it, so great job on that. So in terms of the Tchaikovsky, we'll continue to work on that. The idea of keeping the vibrato, to work on that, like to deconstruct that, is really just even to just slow the notes way down, and even though you wouldn't play the same vibrato on each note, in reality, is to literally, like a tone practice, tone row or vocalese, just sing from note to note on the instrument and try to keep the vibrato consistent so you have better control of it. Often this is just, if you start thinking about it, you're going to do it. It's almost more an awareness thing than a capacity thing, you know, about whether you can do it or not. I think it's more remembering what to do. And it's an easy habit to vibrate on accent. As my teacher would say, you end up putting the accents on the wrong syllables, you know. So, uh, so we try not to put the accents on the wrong syllables. Okay? But um, that phrasing is, is uh, what we'll continue to work on. And as you get more used to that read, you'll feel a little more comfortable to, to move around you know, with sound, but it's, it really is a good sound, resonant and clear. Okay, so I think we'll leave that at that today. I don't think we have anyone else who wants to play. We, I don't think. So what we have is a few minutes left. It is the very last session of this group of sessions. So I'd love to open the floor to anyone, of course, I could always count on Professor Powell because he's so smart at coming up with good topics and ways of looking at things. Um, but we, I'd like to, before the 
the very old guy and the the kid, Mr. Powell, uh, oh, get into, get, get well into done. A, get into a con- I know, look, I, you know, uh, I'm smooth operator. But anyway, before we get into some discussion, does anyone have anything? Well, first of all, although you, uh, you know, of course, Sequoia, you and I will see each other. Do you have any thoughts about about this, or or is this clear to you? And I don't want to leave you out of it. Yeah, you, Sequoia. I don't know if I there's an. Okay. You're really okay. 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 Yeah. I just wanted. I didn't want to shut you down if there was something you wanted to to share. That's all. Okay. Well, I'll see you this afternoon. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. So wonderful job, actually. So does anyone have any thoughts, ideas? Well, let me even ask this for future uh, voids of wisdom from the old guy, the godfather, as my students would call me. Um, are there topics? I mean, questions for the moment, which are great. And I'd be happy to know if there are things you would we, you wish we could work on in these types of sessions. Because as much as I can circular talk, I'm much happier to offer what is useful to you. And um, that's my main goal is to contribute something that's helpful. So any thoughts or any questions about anything about music in general? Yes, sir. This is Elliot. Yes. You know, I wanted to say thank you so much for all of these master classes. They have been very helpful in just breaking it down, um, manageable chunks, things that I can apply to my own practice. Like week after week, you're, you're telling me like little bits and I'm just like writing down some of the things <laughs> as you're saying it. And, uh, you know, this, this is a very valuable experience for me. So thank you. Elliot, my pleasure. And to know that it's helpful to you is then that that's my reward. You know, that's my reward to uh, thank you for saying so. Um, not that every, I need people to say that to me, you know, but it is, it always feels good. You know, it feels good to know it's useful to you. Uh, I have put a lot of thought and a lot of years into it. Um, and I'm still trying to learn and, um, and, and you're a wonderful young player. Uh, I like the stuff I've heard you play, you know, things in the, Q class type type stuff and all that, you know, I, uh, you're, you know, you're on the right track and applying these things, not because I said them, but because I've learned them from other people, you know, uh, will, will help, as you know, they will help you. And uh, I still try to apply them because I'm not ready. You know, I could just retire. But one reason I don't is I'm not, I spent a lifetime learning to play the bassoon and I'm not ready to give it up yet. You know, I'm not ready to to lose the the le- whatever level of proficiency I have on the instrument. I'm not ready to lose it, you know. And I love the music. I mean, I love to listen to music. You know, like I don't have to play it in order to enjoy it, but it brings me such joy. You know, and so I apply all of these principles that I've been trying to share with you myself in my own playing. Yeah, your insights are invaluable. Thank you. Well, there you go. I wish my wife were in the room. I'm going to, well, this is recorded. So I am going to be able to make a loop out of that. And We've got that on, on, on film, as it were. We have on, on tape, yes. Thank you for that unsolicited testimonial. <laughs> anybody else? You don't have to continue with the thank yous. I mean, I appreciate them. But anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Did someone raise? Yeah. Byron, your hand went Emilio. up. And Anna? Emilio, sure. Emilio, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. yes. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, Again, thank you. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, this is just more pertaining to audition. So, when you, when you're listening to someone, how much can they're playing with a great sound? There's a lot of expression, but what are those technical? Well, not that there typically would be, but what's something that would hit your ear and say, uh, "Not, not quite there." Well, the first one is intonation. That's. And that's what I mean about in the earlier episodes about being in your sound and in tune. And in the case of vibrato, you know, having vibrato under control, you know, depending on the instrument, obviously different use or not use of vibrato, you know. 
but all of that having putting it under the tone production. And and that goes to like we we're talking with Anna today, not just that you can play a beautiful long solo, lyrical solo with those qualities, but that you could play something like the Mendelssohn with that clarity, the same clarity. And the greatest players that I ever heard, like orchestra players, just play like that, <laughs> you know, with that sense of clarity and unending. And the other thing I suggest to you all is like establish especially at this day and age, who is, you know, it's like marketing analysis. Who is successful? How do they play? Whether you like it or not, that's what's successful. I don't agree with everything I hear in orchestras. And one reason I was less successful, which is my own fault, is I'm not the most disciplined player. And I was lucky to happen on to like the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra and uh, a lot of chamber music and contemporary playing. And I kind of really put the pedal to the metal because when the city opera job opened, I thought this is a great job for me. It's part time. It's opera. You know, I could fit my other stuff in. <laughs> Everything I try to get out. Of. The only thing I I don't get out of is teaching, but I had a whole career of professional activities that I could get out of. <laughs> that was the goal. I could go do something else. The one thing I wouldn't shortchange. I I think I could say this honestly. Because whether or not I'm a good teacher, I always showed up. I have always showed up. And if that meant dropping record dates or stuff like that, not to mess with my students, I did that. That was my choice. I'm not saying someone had changed the schedule for a record date is a bad person, but I made my choices, you know? And so if the City Opera, I really disciplined myself in a way. A lot of things that I'm telling you about was because I decided I should, in the right, in, in the to use a uh, rock and roll song from when I was a youth, get a job. It would be nice to have a steady gig, even part-time. So um, the, I don't agree with everything I hear, but what I do hear, the thing you cannot deny when, when I listen to orchestras, whether I like the style or not, is they play with great a great deal of control. You have to have that control. You just have to. It's just... In that you just there is no other way around it in that world and from the ensemble standpoint emilio i have to echo exactly the same thing when i'm listening to an audition the first wrench that gets thrown in my ear is is intonation uh the other stuff you can work on in an ensemble context and bring through a rehearsal cycle into a performance but but intonation is is the first and foremost consideration that makes me go, ah, uh, yeah. we can't do that. And, and the second thing that goes right with it is rhythm. Interior Agreed. tempo and rhythm. Yeah, Agreed. I mean, not that we were ignoring that, but just to say, and you could even argue, like, and you were asking this, you asked this sort of question. The way you framed your question is something I say in a different way. Another way of looking at it, there are things, and I've said it to this class, subjective and objective. Now, my ear isn't as strong as some people I know, like Miss LeClaire, who plays first bassoon and philharmonic, when we've listened to auditions together for school, because we don't play in the same orchestra. Um, certain things about intonation bug her more than me, but that's because she has a better ear than I do. So I'm not criticizing her. I just, certain things will fly by me or I'll just enjoy the sound and not worry about the pitch, you know? But man, she's got an ear like, like you know, like she's like, got a great ear among other things that's one of the reasons she plays so great but um so while that's an objective thing are you in tune or not even in terms of my ability to assess it it becomes somewhat subjective right but sound uh, pitch and rhythm are as close as you can get to objective now that's another thing with rhythm when i hear somebody play and I hear what to me seems clearly to be a nuance, I don't think they have bad rhythm. Some people hear certain nuance and don't like it as like they ascribe it to a lack of rhythmic discipline. You know, so so I think the best approach is to try to, to, to live a clean life when it comes to pitch and rhythm. And some of the suggestions I gave you, like playing a, like a solo like Bolero at a very big beat pattern so that 
you're checking in with the with the metronome, but you're taking on much more responsibility, right? It's the same way with the meter. If you just sit there and let the meter tell you sharp, flat, flat, sharp, that that's good in the pinch. And I check things out that way, you know, myself, and really just go let let the you know, get led by the nose, so to speak, by the by the tuner. But ultimately, that's a, a good check-in. But then I have to go back and internalize that. And nothing is more aggravated. And I was on a couple of jobs where, like, clarinet player, no offense, but, you know, I sit next to the clarinet. So that's my cross, the bear, another cross, the bear. Sitting there with a tuner on, and I'm thinking, you know, I mean, it's helpful sometimes just to make sure, you know, you're close, you know. But ultimately, you got to you gotta voice the chord, and you got to play with other people, right? But in your own playing, man, like for me, I think one of my, speaking of my ear, or lack thereof, Probably one of the things that didn't help me out in auditions is you play an audition by yourself. So being in tune with yourself, you know, is crucial. I'm a pretty good ensemble player. I generally find the prevailing pitch when I'm playing with people. And I enjoy that. I enjoy, as much as I joke about clarinet players, I enjoy locking in with a clarinet player and, and creating that clarinet sound and being the bottom half, so to speak, the base of that that composite sound. I love that. That's not like, I don't Frank Morelli, I don't play with you. No, I love this to get in there and do that, you know? So... Uh, and I just jump in to tell you that the greatest musical compliment I ever received as an orchestral clarinet player came from a bassoonist who said, you know, you're the only clarinet player I can play in tune with. And I, I will tell you now that that's Mark Clegg from the University of Michigan. So oh, cool. makes me look even shinier. But that the the speed with which you can listen and adjust to an instrument outside your own section, hear the tone color, hear the pitch center, and react uh, it determines how good an ensemble player you can be. Right, and it is totally. it is the attention that. Professor Morelli uh, mentioned earlier this session that I think is a really huge component of that. When I, you know, if I'm playing with the horns, I'm not really using vibrato often, like, you know, we'd have Midsummer Night's Dream and the, in the what is it, Serenade, what, what is the movement? Bom, ba, ba, da, da, dee, dee. I forget the name of that movement, but the, the famous Just horn before horn. the chorus, and yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I, we're like we're fourth and fifth horn or fifth and sixth horns in the bassoon section. I forget how many horns there are in there. I think there were four. But anyway, so my job is not to be a, you know, my job then is, you know, which I love, like playing with Mr. Jolly as I do in a woodwind quintet. In fact, I arranged the third act of Tusca for woodwind quintet because it's really a tone poem. And one of the things I did was to, I get to play in unison with him as like second horn in the opening of the third act with a giant horn fanfare. Bum, bum, ba, 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 ba. So I get to play second horn at Dave Jolly. There, believe me, there's nothing better than that. Nice work if you can get it. But there, I'm not going to go, da, da, da. You know, then I'm there, right? Play with the clarinet, I seldom use vibrato. If I'm playing with the flute or the oboe, I actually try to match their vibratos. I try to get in sync with them. So it really, and not every time the same, but those are considerations that one makes on the fly and you can detect that a little bit in an audition by how someone plays that's another thing you want to be able to reflect the sound of the orchestra in your playing it's like a hologram like you're just playing your instrument but the sound of you you imply what the orchestra is sounding like at that moment all right any other questions uh, there were a couple of other people i think thank you anna you're you welcome, had one man. I just wanted to add on uh, Elliot, like, thank you so much. It's it's really an honor. And this is so meaningful and invaluable to me, like, not just as a, as a musician, as an artist, but as a teacher, too. Thank you so much. I hope so. I want to pass on. Thank you, Anna. You and I are already buddies, but uh, and I appreciate it. But, you know, it is our our goal it is our responsibility in the best sense of that word a holy responsibility to pass on what we know and in that regard the idea of hopefully music educators listening to this i'd love to think that some of the techniques that i'm recommending find their way to younger players too to the teaching of younger players 
obviously it always has to be appropriate to the age and the youngest players i think we never want them to feel like they're being punished for having taken on a pursuit like learning an instrument we want them to tap into the joy and just love it and you grab the teachable moment along the way but as they get older you know sharing these ideas and uh any anybody else I, there was maybe someone else had sort of raised their hand there's carry your here. video popped on did you have a question no i just also wanted to say thank you oh, and you for being so kind a couple of weeks ago like i'm one of those people who gets nervous pretty easily and i was worried about like playing in front of everybody but you're really kind and supportive and i really appreciate that so thank you you're welcome well you played beautifully in the mozart clarinet concerto i remember and um you have to get past that feeling i know that's easier said than done but you know there are critical people in this world you know that are critical to be critical then most people in the audience and even people listening to an audition we're hoping to identify a wonderful player we want you to do well I'm not sitting there going, I ah, got you. <laughs> You're out. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. So you have to get past that. You have to believe in yourself. Uh, one of the books I read, it's antiquated now. It's by a man named Maxwell Maltz. And it was on a reading list that Don Green put together, who did the peak performance for musicians. And Maxwell, and then we'll, we'll end with this. And this is make, it's something too serious to go along with your issue. You'll see what I mean by that, or our issue. We all have it. But it has to do with progress and self-confidence. This maybe is a good way to, to put a benediction on this thing. And that was, he had been, he was a surgeon, a plastic surgeon and a psychologist, psychiatrist. I think he went into psychiatry as an interest after having worked with his patients and he wasn't a plastic surgeon that was doing like nose jobs in LA he was someone who dealt with people with congenital malformations or accidents you know uh, putting people back together or back together for the first time you know together for the first time and he said that with some people if you fix their deformity their malformation right when they looked in the mirror afterwards, they were cured. They saw themselves, the, the, new, the, the new me, you know. He said, some people, even when you fix them, they still see the old picture. Like they're, they, they have trouble. And that's not, other, they're being resentful or it's, that's how much it, it's internalized. So that's what I mean about it being very serious compared to playing the clarinet or the bassoon. But the fact is, you are not the child you used to be. You are not the person with the problem you used to have. You have other problems, like me, when I say that. I can't do this. I wish I could do that. I can't make this. All right, sure. Well, there's a million things. There's much more I can't do than what I can do. But it is healthy. It is you have to take stock you have to take a, you have to take responsibility you have to take responsibility for what you have achieved and take stock of it and be proud of it and you have to take responsibility for what you need to achieve so don't keep thinking old thoughts right and and sure everybody i get nervous you know, i'm at this point in my life you know i'm not like playing for to get a job, it's a lot easier to play excerpts when you're not preparing them for auditions. I know that. I can demonstrate them. Some say, wow, that was pretty good. <laughs> I wish I could, you know, because I'm not worried about it, you know. <laughs> I'm not too worried about making a, my fool of myself in front of you, and I'm not trying out for a job. So for me, you know, there's got to be something good about becoming an old guy, so at least that's one good thing. But you have to, you have to put the things that you've accomplished, you have to take stock in them, and take credit for them. And you also have to take stock and be responsible for what you need to improve, which I know I'm not lecturing you about that like I don't think you want to do that. Right? It's, it is overly self-absorbed to either love yourself too much or dislike yourself too much. And this is a way to kind of balance that. Be proud of what you've accomplished. It's yours. You did it. 
be mindful of what you need to achieve. And know that people listening to you, by and large, just want you to play great and are looking forward to hearing it. Okay? If that's, I hope, maybe a little helpful. Uh, it's hard to get past those nerves. I know. I know. But try to remember that, okay? All right. Many, many, many thanks, Frank. This has been a genuine pleasure, as you've gotten to see. Um, and I can do no better than to end with the words of Trey Crowder. Love y'all. See you soon. Okay. Take care, everybody. See my class later. Thank bye you. Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, that was superb. Thank you, Joe. Um, this is the last one, right? Yes, of this series. I'm going to save the chat because...